Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Rob King, and I'm here today to talk about scaling Orchard. Um, I'm going to cover things like growing an Orchard solution past 140 projects, and also putting it into a multi-node production environment, um, serving very high throughp uh, throughput websites. Um, aside, so aside from introducing myself and who BDA, I'm going to go through a few pointers on what things that have tripped us up with solution, a solution architecture. Uh, also talk about performance when we start talking about the, the rate of throughput that we uh, have with our be uh, products at Bead. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some issues that have come uh, we've come across that only happen because we're in a multi-node environment. Um, the, those things just wouldn't happen um, with one node. And also some things that uh, we haven't actually solved yet uh, too. So uh, who am I? Uh, I'm the technical lead on the CMS team at Bead Gaming. Uh, I'm also the third most prolific deleter of Orchard, according to the re repo. Um, <laughs> basically, um, I'm, I'm eighth for additions and third for deletions. Um, that is basically because um, I'm the guy who re replaced the lib, lib folder with NuGet, and so basically it affected pretty much the entire thing. <laughs> um, so, um, it was actually an example of something that became a necessity for Bead. Um, trying to manage dependencies is one of the single greatest challenges we've had. And having the lib folder there, and then our own modules, trying to share between lib, and as soon as you touch NuGet, all the references change and go over to the NuGet packages, and then having to revert to that. It, that's why I did that PR. And um, it was well received, so um, hopefully, yeah, that, hopefully it was a good memory. Um, so what do B do? Uh, we offer a range of products. Our primary one is a platform for providing the online gaming uh, gambling industry with uh, the ability, basically we provide all of the fun functionality required to set up an online bingo or casino site. Um, we do things like banking transactions, player wallets, promotions, every, every, you name it. Um, now that's contained within our core platform and we our, our clients have a choice. They can either build their own website and use our public API and have just a platform or they can take simple single page web applications and then they would use our API and those web, those web applications are um, written by us but they use the same API or alternatively you can have a full content management system and that's where Zeus comes in. So I'll come to Zeus, I meant Orchard. <laughs> so the vision for Bead Gaming. Our vision is to be the first choice gaming platform for all regulated uh, um, casinos and bingo websites. Some of the sites here, um, they operate, uh, these on the right, um, anyone who's from the UK, you'll have heard of Mecca Bingo, I'm almost certain of that, and probably Grosvenor Casino as well. Uh, some of the others, uh, not so much, um, Health Bingo is obviously part of our health lottery. Um, and certainly um, iDeliverable and Lombeek are very familiar with both of those two big sites. Uh, they contributed quite a lot to it. So. Bead was founded in 2012, and our product was uh, called Apollo. Uh, I hope you know what that picture is a reference to. Um, if not, just come and speak to me afterwards. <laughs> a small uh, group of PHP developers put together the site, and it was basically the entire platform in one product. It was a custom CMS um, and written in PHP as well, with a MySQL backend. And we knew that if we wanted to fulfill our vision, then we needed something that was going to be a lot more powerful, uh, scalable, and more robust. So that was Zeus. Um, it was decided that creating customizable bingo sites, allowing our clients to set up a bingo game or a bingo room in any way that they saw fit, that was going to be our USP. Um, Apollo just didn't offer the scalability that we needed for this, and we had a prospective large new client uh, on the horizon, and we knew we needed something else. So that was when we decided to go with .NET. Um, it was primarily, that was the developer decision. Um, new developers coming into Bead uh, insisted on .NET. And uh, one guy actually flat refused to write anything else. And uh, <laughs> so uh, we went with, uh, we were very happy with that because uh, um, we're based in Newcastle upon Tyne in the North of England. And there is an abundance of .NET developers, um, good quality developers in .NET uh, in Newcastle. And, um, there isn't any really any PHP ones around. Uh, we actually uh, at one point tried to get some and it failed. So we were glad to move to .NET. And in 2015, we uh, very much upscaled our, the size of our uh, development team and we did it really quickly. And I think that's only possible because of this decision. Um, we chose SQL Server 
as the natural database partner for, uh, for .NET and Azure for hosting. There wasn't really much d debate in-house on Azure versus AWS because, uh, to quote AWS, they do not allow anything that constitutes, promotes, facilitates, or permits gambling, whereas Azure don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Orchard was uh, selected for its extensibility um, and the multi-tenancy, and also the fact that everyone here, um, and well, everyone's actively contributing to it to improve it. Um, things like layer rules and widgets um, just offered everything we needed to provide this uh, customizable bingo vision. And so that's where Zeus came from. We uh, ported over uh, bingo stars over from Apollo. And then by the time our big, this big client came along, um, we already had um, these five sites running in o uh, on Zeus. We work, started work on Grove the Casino first. And then with Lombeek's help, we start, got Mecca done to a very tight deadline, shall we say. And um, on February 29th last year, um, those two sites went live. Later this month, and it's actually next month, and Ratcha is our first international site or launching in Spain. And um, along with Enracha, the clients that we are now signing, we found they are um, almost exclusively international now, um, all over the world. So localization has become a big focus for what we're doing at the moment. And I'm looking forward to Benedict's talk on that. Um, I'll show, I'm going to talk mostly about Mecca today because Mecca is the site that really does have the throughput and really is our, is our busy site. I mean, Grosvenor is busy, but Mecca is, is the one. So that's the one I'll probably, I'm going to mostly reference. And I'll be talking about its performance as well. So. Um, Getting where we are, uh, one thing that's tripped us up um, while we've been expanding Zeus is the dependency, uh, is our features and the number of features and the dependencies between them. So I'm going to talk about that um, in this section. So, um, let's get um, feature switching, um, it's, that's considered by us at B to be probably the single most, we do, it's our, our favourite part of uh, Orchard, the ability to create features, put them into production and then switch them on when we're ready. Um, it's, it's great. And so basically we have a mantra um, at Bead that if you create a new feature and it's not switchable, then you, your pull request isn't going to get merged. It's not going in. Um, the problem with that is that because everything has to be in a feature, we end up with a lot of features, um, an awful lot of features. <laughs> that is six months ago. Um, I've eliminated Core Orchard there. That is just Bead's mod uh, features and uh, the line obviously the interconnecting lines. Can you see that on there okay? Um, hopefully you can. It's troublesome, to say the least. Um, there's 30 or 40 modules containing those features, and um, we have an acceptance test that checks that when you've created a feature, you haven't missed a dependency, but we don't have one that checks you haven't got any unnecessary ones, and uh, that no, not yet, anyway. So, adding dependencies to module.txt willy-nilly <laughs> can cause that. <laughs> right. Here I went to turn off our one of our caching modules. Um, that popped up. And because I'm used to a dependency prompt, I didn't look at it. I just hit enter. And uh, well, that was it. The whole site was finished. Um, that is pretty much everything. You've, you've done that. Yeah, that, was, that, that basically was it. That was the end of the site. And we had to recook. I had to, it was local, so it was OK. Um, I recooked the whole site, and we were all right. But if that, if, if that button was there for a, a content manager in production, so if someone had clicked that button, then that would be it. We can't just recook on production. So um, yeah. And that was basically caused by an errant reference to uh, the caching module in our was just one, one dependency in authentication was what caused that prompt. Um, the project references are, are partly to blame, I think, because we tend to just... Sorry, I'm going to um, jump back a second. Yeah, so basically everything pretty much depends on authentication because uh, it, there, there was some core interfaces inside there. So once that little reference there, um, once I turned that off, that's what caused the problem. Um, we do have a tendency that we'll just do project references, and because everything can see each other in the project references, uh, the developers, if it provides a shortcut or an easy way of doing something, they'll just trick the dependency in, and that's how we end up where we were. Um, just to give an example. So let's take a, a banking um, feature. It, there's a module, it has 10 services in it, say, for example. Uh, single, single implementation of each inside the module. 
Um, there's no references to any other module or anything like that, so that's all good so far. But then a new requirement uh, comes along, and basically what, we do, what, what you could do is create a new implementation of each service, but because you've got all the things in there, um, so you've got uh, like the parts and the drivers and the handlers and models and all of that, and there's quite a lot going on, the decision is to put it into a separate module. What tends to happen is that the new module will have a project reference to the original module, there'll be a new implementation um, in the new module that is implementing the interface in the first one, hence the need for the reference, and then we introduce the dependencies straight away. And this is certainly something we've done a, a lot um, at BEAD. So what we're trying to do is a, a domain-driven design. So we extract the interface into a common module and have the two implementations who don't know anything about each other sharing the common module and the common interface. By doing that, you go from that original mess to this where you have a central, com we're not quite there with the domain driven design at this point, but now it looks a lot more natural. Uh, we can safely turn off any feature and it's nothing, nothing's talking to each other and you will basically not fall into the trap that I fell into. Um, the key to it all really is that they have no knowledge of each other. What we really aim for though is to not have this potentially bloated common module in the middle. And we end up more like with something like this where th in logical components, nothing can see each other and you can safely turn off anything without worrying that you're going to get that prompt that I showed you before. The, uh, f for this today, I, uh, create, I basically created a, mo a module, an Orchard module, uh, because I tried to draw out those diagrams and it was basically looked like the scribblings of a madman on, on a white wall. <laughs> Um, so I created a module which is open sourced. If anyone wants to have a look at the dependencies inside their own uh, Orchard applications, uh, you can go there. I'll, uh, I'll try, I can leave it up on the uh, screen at the end. Um, yeah. Performance is well, probably the biggest pain point um, in Zeus. This is the directive that was given to the development team on day one of building it. Uh, suffice to say, we paid for this approach. Beats platform uh, is a collection of microservices and each has a specific um, area of functionality for our platform. At the beginning, the platform wasn't particularly well documented and uh, each services team had their own way of presenting their API. Uh, there were also gaps in functionality. So what that tended to happen was that those gaps were getting filled in Zeus itself. So it was doing more than just being a CMS. Um, fortunately today, we have uh, introduced a middleware which gives us a, a semantically versioned, uh, documented API, and we filled the gaps, which means that now Zeus can go back to being just a CMS. And removing that overhead um, is certainly something I would, I would always recommend. So this is um, Mecca Bingo's uh, throughput um, a few weeks ago. This was during a, a free bingo event. So this is just the web traffic, uh, purely the web traffic that was what was hitting Zeus. Um, it's hosted in virtual machines uh, in Azure. There are 12 nodes, although we do scale up uh, during periods like this, um, usually to about 18. They have a, um, a central Redis server and, and a, uh, for caching. It's centralized and shared between the nodes, and then a SQL cluster for the content database. Um, the, the load like this, um, 5,000 requests a minute was when it, where it was, uh, as we see here on the average, um, and when it's quiet, we you can see around 1,500 to 2,000 requests a minute. That's just on, on, on a regular day. Um, so about two to three million uh, requests per day. Um, one of the things we've problems we face is that nearly all of Mecca Bingo is on authenticated pages. There's very little you can do on the site unless you've logged in, which immediately brings up the problem which, uh, which Daniel and Chris are solving with pla uh, placeholders. Um, we have exactly things like the player's current balance is in our, is in our header bar. So we, we had to, a lot of problems with trying to get a performant website because without caching, uh, Me Mecca just doesn't work like, at all. Um, this, sort of traf this sort of traffic is also the reason why we have abandoned multi-tenancy in production for this site. 
Um, basically, the client wasn't willing to accept the risk that if Mecca got very busy and for whatever reason went down, it would take Grosvenor with it. So they just they didn't want that. So we haven't we haven't done that. Um, that was their decision as much as it was ours. So I think everyone would agree that without caching, um, Orchard isn't, isn't too terribly fast. And we just discovered very quickly that without a robust caching st um, strategy, um, th the two sites would grind to a halt and go down entirely, to be honest. Uh, I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail uh, in a little while. So this brings me to uh, layer rule caching. So one of the big problems um, that here with Grosvenor and Mecca is the sheer number of layer rules that we have. Um, and they are evaluated, obviously, on every page request. Making matters worse, I looked at the production system uh, for just a few days ago, and I found that there were, t there were, although there were 200 layer rules on there, uh, 52 of them didn't actually have any content on them. So when you're starting to look at it on the scale, these empty layer rules are just an extra, an, um, an extra process that we need to get rid of. I don't know if you can see that on this projector too well. But um, the issue of empty layers is actually we've, we have solved this one. Um, we have a feature called cache layers. Um, this enable caches the rules themselves into Redis. Um, and that means that they aren't retrieved from a content manager. Uh, not only is this faster, because it means not going to a SQL server, but also the feature itself filters out the empty ones. The problem with empty um, layer rules is it's not so much the problem with them, but those were created by co our clients, our customers, just going in creating a layer rule for whatever reason that we can't really control. And they don't realize uh, any implication to what they're doing. Um, so this is just r really removing that sort of lack of trust, if, uh, if that's uh, any other way of putting it. So for distributed output caches, something that came up um, because we have got our output cache on a centralized Redis server. And then we have all these different nodes contacting that. The problem is that if the Redis server goes down, then every node is going to fall back to SQL Server. This is actually uh, this has happened as well. So, yeah, sorry, I've missed a post one of that slide already. So, um, as you can see, yeah, that's basically simple. That's what I was just describing. I meant to put that on the screen at the time. So I've only put one Zeus box on here, but let's just say there are 12 or 18 or however many. Each one is using, is using a central Redis server and then falling back to SQL Server. It contains all the content that will be accessed if, Redis, uh, if the data isn't in Redis. What the distributed output cache will do. Um, so what we've done is we've introduced an in-memory cache um, inside the inside of Orchard itself. And we're using um, the memory cache to save us going to Redis for that box. So if you hit that node, and a page is in the in memory cache, it'll serve it. If it's not in there, it will get it from Redis. It will then put it into the in memory cache for the subsequent request on that node. If it's not in Redis, it will get it from SQL Server and populate both Redis and that node. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Is that in memory provider implemented as an output cache storage provider, or is it something more elaborate? It is the memory cache of .NET. Of ASP.NET. Oh yeah, and uh, it jacks into output cache by sort of being an output cache storage provider. Yeah. Oh yeah, cool. yeah. So um, now we have the thing of when we update the content, we need to of course tell all of the nodes that the content has changed. So that's when we brought in a message bus. At the moment, we don't have any synchronization between the in-memory cache on each node. Um, that is something that we would look to improve. Um, we don't have any content uh, context of a, a sticky node. So if a user is making a request and then they make another one, they won't necessarily end up on the same box. So um, th that's why that might be something to improve on. So the advantages um, of using the distributed output cache is that if something's in local memory, we've eliminated the need for um, a, a network hop. Um, also, there are dependency on Redis. If Redis goes down, there is also still a chance that the, re the request is available in memory, so that wouldn't be a problem. But even if it isn't on to one particular node, if the other 11 nodes have it in memory, they're not all going to go running to SQL Server at once. So it, it reduces the dependency. Um, and all of the um, in-memory cache is updated by the same Redis server, so they, tend to, they all do get the most recent and the same data. 
The disadvantage is that we haven't removed uh, the dependency of an external server entirely. Um, and of course, we've brought in the message bus, which is something else we absolutely need. Otherwise, we'll be serving stale data if something changes. So um, issues on multiple nodes. Um, there are things that have happened since we went live last year that have only happened because we are on a multi-node um, environment in production. So I just want to give you an idea of this. So um, last year, New Relic uh, informed our ops team that the Mecha Bingo site was down. It caused a Severity 1 uh, production incident. And it was we've after investigating, we found that there was a deadlock issue on the scheduled tasks table in our database. Um, we found that there was a scheduled task set to run every four hours. And um, what that task did was call a third party API, pull some data down, and then create some content items. Fairly straightforward. What the problem we found was we went into the scheduled task, uh, the, the actual scheduled task table, and found that there were 1.3 million records in that table. And there was supposed to be one. Um, so yeah, that, that's why I went down. <laughs> um, also, it was, growing it was growing rapidly. Every time we refreshed the query, that number was ticking up in, in, in the tens of thousands. So the, prob the thing what happens is, on a single node, um, Orchard will select the task record at the scheduled time, let's say midnight. It'll, rec it'll delete the record to prevent it being run again. The task is executed. Uh, succeeds and it schedules it for four o'clock and if it fails it'll just put it back in to give it another try. For multi-node, I'm just going to do a two-node example to start with, but node one selects the task re record at scheduled time, it then deletes it, so that's great, it executes the task. Node two realizes it's midnight and it grabs the schedule task. It go well, it's just doing a check. It's seeing, is there anything to run? But it's hit the database cache, and that record is still there. So it sees it, then fires a delete statement of, of for an ID that isn't there, so nothing happens. It then executes the task. And the problem is that there's something wrong with the third-party API. It's down. So, that sca so node one's task is, it then fails, and it, it puts a record into the table to try again. Node 2 then fails to as well, and it reschedules it. So now there are two scheduled task records. So immediately, the servers go, no, two records each, and then four records each. And each time it fails, it puts more and more. And this is on 18 nodes, not two. So it basically just goes off. And eventually, with all them nodes hitting all them records, it deadlocks, and then that's, that's it. And that was what caused it. So. The very simple, quick solution that we did um, was actually we just took the, uh, it's can't really see it on the screen too actually, we basically just created a, a, um, a new, a new uh, implementation of the, of the task executor, but we inherited the original and just literally just put in a check. So what we did was we put a config setting in. Um, we, set it, we set it to where basically whether a node should run tasks or not. And what we did was we set it to false and then used a transform in Octopus Deploy to set it to true only on the primary node. So the short-term solution was just to say, just that was that really, and then we put an if statement around the, uh, around the, uh, the sweep. It wasn't the most elegant uh, of solutions, but it did work, um, although the long-term solution in the end was actually to stop using scheduled tasks uh, in Orchard altogether and move to Hangfire, which is what we've done now. Um, but this is uh, still functioning in, in production for us at the moment. So uh, what we haven't solved, um, there's still c quite a few things left. Um, it's obviously, it's a, it's a big project. Um, the two real problems um, are these two. The first one is that our front-end developers, we tend to be, uh, we have our team split. We have front-end devs, and then we have the back-end, mostly Orchard devs. And the front-end guys, they'll make a change to a view. Um, they want to just refresh the screen. They want to see their change. And caching means that they're getting served up the cached content, so they can't see their change. But because of the size of it, and if you turn, if you turn um, the caching off, um, aside from uh, ruining your project, but basically if you turn caching off, 
um, it runs so slowly that they, they find it unusable. So we're currently in trying a bit of a rock and a hard place, um, trying to, th th mostly we turn the caching off or, or constantly having to go in and evict. We have so many different types of cache as well that um, we, we, threw, we threw so much caching into it that actually from a developer's point of view, it's actually it's gone the wrong way. It's the site is running really well in production, but for a developer, um, it, it's not great. And the other one is that um, the recipe cook times are, uh, are very long. Uh, one of our recipes is 7,000 lines. And to cook Grosvenor's recipe, you, you, you set it off and go make a cup of tea or, or go have your lunch or something. Um, it's basically uh, cooking a recipe is just people shudder when they think they're going to have to do it. Um, for these two things, if anyone has a any ideas or suggestions, please do come and see me. Um, we, 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 these are the two things we're, we're solving at the moment. I have talked way too fast. <laughs> uh, uh, we've so we've um, scaled Orchard to serve millions of requests. Um, I would the, the things I would summarise to say is the dependencies between features, probably one of the big things um, that we solved recently that um, saves a lot of headaches. Um, be wary of especially dependencies between modules, if not features. Um, and never treat performance as a second class citizen. Um, really, it should be at the beginning of the project. Um, Caching everything, like really even going to the point of layer rules. I think that's proven uh, essential to us. And when writing features, it's just good to consider multi-node environments. There, there are other things that have happened as well with uh, being multi-node where this issue just wouldn't come up locally or on your like the dev or QA environments. But once you get up there to 18 or more nodes, um, things start do start to creep in, especially deadlocking. Uh, and that's it. Thanks, that was shorter than I thought. Thank you. Can you elaborate on how you uh, were able to cache layer rules? I'm a little bit unclear on how you would have done that. Yeah, so I'll go back to. Hmm? Let's go back. Oh, yeah, here we are. So basically, um, we have um, the, the layer rules themselves. Just we literally took the content of the database and took, we just take a copy and we put it into Redis to save that hop, because with us not running Redis on the same box as um, the website itself, because we didn't want to give that extra load to the web server, which was busy enough, um, that introduces a network hop to get to the SQL server. Um, well, SQL server and Redis, I suppose. Um, so we just take a copy and leave it in there. That's that's basically through Redis Desktop Manager. It's almost like basically it's, 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 it's laid out the same as the table. I don't know if that answers the question. I think so. Yeah? Helps no problem. So, um, the issue you mentioned with uh, the scheduled tasks that execute on multiple nodes, did you want that task to execute on all the nodes or were you perfectly happy with it just running on one of them? We wanted it on one. So was it? Could it I remember when we guys were working with you, we implemented something in Orchard distributed lock. Right. Would it have been an option for you to, to sort of use that to coordinate to make sure that that task could only execute ever on one node? Potentially, but I wasn't involved with it and I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. That might be something we can help Yeah, with. definitely, yeah. Great. Hey, Rob. Uh, do you use the Orchard Combinator module or something more custom for For managing? Um, at the moment, what we have is we have a completely separate repository with um, with our themes in, and um, the front end guys tend to just sort of. Well, I don't really do. I'm, I'm, I'm back in dev. I don't really know the total ins and outs of it. But uh, we've taken out really the everything. Um, the only views in Zeus are for the admin area. Um, everything else, we just it, we have an empty view, and it'll it might have some something on it. it doesn't matter because it gets suppressed, and the, uh, the back end guys don't really deal with the views at all. It's all out there. Um, so. The answer would almost certainly be no. They don't use Combinator. It's all it's all very custom. Yeah, I mean the, the, those guys don't. They're not even using jQuery or anything at all. Everything's very, like there's no dependencies or anything really. Yeah. Right. Of the layer caching. Yeah. No. So the the rule itself is what we're caching. Not on every request, no. They stay. They stay the layers stay in there. 
And then it basically, it, it's reading that instead of going to the database. The, the rule itself, and then it does evaluate it if the, page, if the requested page is not in the cache. So what yeah. you're saying is the trip to the Compass Manager just to get the layer rule out. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Actually, that cache does two things. Go on, then. Yeah, uh, <laughs> please do. Yeah, he wrote it. <laughs> it. Yeah, so it prevents the call to the Content Manager to get the layers on the requests. And the second thing it does is it keeps track of which layers have no widgets in them. Yeah, that's so yeah, that was the so thing with all the empty layers. Yeah, yeah, that was actually th that was the thing I was saying about trusting customers. Uh, that th when they go into the back office and they just create a layer, decide they don't want to bother with it anymore, and they walk off and they leave the layer sitting there. Uh, the rule, sorry, I should say. Um, so the expensive and yeah. Only evaluating the layers if it had a widget in, but to calculate that on the fly, it had to go to the compromise it, check the widgets, <laughs> so it was a, it's a chicken and egg which is why we cache which layers have. Yeah. Is that anything else? Um, so you have each of your webheads has an in memory cache to prevent it going back and forth to Rails, which also prevents it going back and forth to the database. <coughs> What is your TTL for each of those layers? Because we have a very similar setup at one stop where we have an API that caches calls from the database, and then we have a client node that caches calls from the API. And then you know there's actually it's, it's some instances where we then cache again in memory in the node. And our problem is that we can't get rid of it now. Like we have a list of countries in our checkout, and in order to get rid of it, you have to go through and purge like every single layer in a very prescribed. And then you have to do a little hula dance, and like there's a couple things you have to do. So <laughs> we're looking at, at really cutting down our efficiency. And our TTLs are like you know 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 24 hours. Like you know, have you guys found that lower TTLs are, are more effective in getting rid of stuff, or what do you guys do about that? That I have, I do not know. Do you know that, Chris? Um, what were you talking about there? TTLs for all your cache layers. Like how long do you keep it in each one of those? Um, layers? It's not configured on a per layer basis. It tends to be per item, but what? What do you aim for is um, to keep it in indefinitely mm -hmm. and to have some sort of notification when something else fires. Kill it on the yeah. and it changes. Yeah, yeah that's change. the ideal situation, but that's not always possible. But mm -hmm. when it's not possible, um, it's it's always configurable, and if um, the ops teams can kind of scale that out and change it, to yeah. 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 Interesting. But more often than not, evict on when you need to. Mm -hmm. We try to. It's okay, just cache everything. And then it's like, uh, yeah, now we got to go through and get rid of stuff. And like, that's a real challenge now. So yeah, we have, because we have a lot of caches, that's what introduces the problems for the front end guys. Because it's not just a case of going to the statistics screen and hit evict. Yeah. There's other things going on. Yeah. So it's a real pain for them. And that's, like I say, we're, we're trying to resolve at the moment. Um, we have this uh, the hope that if we m when we move to layouts instead of layer, um, instead of widgets and layers layer rules, it might help. But it's, a, it's just a pipe dream at the moment. And something this big, moving something as simple as that, it just takes forever. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Yeah, do you have, a, uh, you mentioned you have some issues sometimes with multi-nodes in production. Do you have uh, uh, multi-node setups in QA and dev that, and you run performance tests on QA and dev to <laughs> try to start to solve problems? We have, there's two, no we have two nodes on develop uh, dev and QA. Um, but when we do a performance test, we have a staging environment which has, I think, I think it's four. Um, and that's where we run our performance and load tests. Um, but one thing that, for example, schedule tasks, that isn't something that was actually, uh, if that third party API hadn't failed, that would never have actually happened. Uh, it was just a combination of things, so we, we would never have caught that. But yeah, we do, our, we do have a, a four node staging environment. Yeah. And we also have a non production environment as well. So our pipeline at the moment is um, dev QA staging. And then we deploy it to the uh, NP environment, which is what our client, it's that's for them to then do testing and them to make sure they're happy with it. So it's a total replica of production. And then it goes out. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else? A little no? generic scaling question, but okay. um, has your orienting 
into anything where you had um, issues with content manager regarding like size limitations of having just too many assets? Only in so Insofar as that goes, not only that the more it grows, things get slower, but like there's no like not as far as like hitting limitations. I can't think of, of any, any instances of that now. Keeping our um, actual like front end front end self out of the way um, does help with that, um, but no, I, I can't think of any. So the crashing at 1.3 million records was yeah. just just crashing, not a hard rep limit on that? No, it wasn't. It was actually um, a, a deadlock as much as anything. So we had 18 nodes all trying to select, at one point, each trying to select 1.3 million records, then trying mm -hmm. to delete those records while all the locks are being held. And everything just went <laughs> So it just hit a number and then didn't work. Yeah. OK, that's it. No, hey, thank you.